Good evening. Okay. You were the ones who have stayed with me in my trials uh, after several weeks of talking about ecumenical councils and Vatican II and then uh, doing the first uh, encyclical of Pius XII as well as that first document. Uh, so thank you for uh, hanging in through all of this. Um, a couple of uh, very simple housekeeping details. Uh, of course, our friends from St. Benedict are over there with some of the books that you know, we mentioned uh, in the course of the class. There's also so if you haven't gotten the, uh, the book um, with which we're reading these things, then they have that as well. Um, if you do not have any of the handouts that have been given out uh, up until now, then Angela, uh, our Director of Catechism and Evangelization, has those. Um, and those are actually, I think, the last handouts that, that you'll have during this, because the rest of it is just really being uh, uh, kind of delving into the text. So before we begin tonight's class, uh, since October is the month especially dedicated to the rosary uh, and to Our Lady, I want to share with you as our prayer today a poem which we have no idea where it comes from, uh, but the Dominican Sisters of Summit, New Jersey, of all people, found this thing and set it to music. Uh, and I think it is a really particularly beautiful way to make that connection between uh, Our Lady and Our Blessed Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Mary the dawn, Christ the perfect day. Mary the gate, Christ the heavenly way. Mary the root, Christ the mystic vine. Mary the grape, Christ the sacred wine. Mary the wheat, Christ the living bread. Mary the stem, Christ the rose blood red. Mary the font, Christ the cleansing flood. Mary the cup, Christ the saving blood. Mary the temple, Christ the temple's Lord. Mary the shrine, Christ the God adored. Mary the beacon, Christ the haven's rest. Mary the mirror, Christ the vision blessed. Mary the mother, Christ the mother's son. By all things blessed while endless ages run. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, remember how we always like to go to the very beginning. So you're thinking 1962, first day of the council. No, way back to the Old Testament. Now, so the Jews, you're like, wait a minute, you're starting this thing on the church with the Jews. Yes, there's a reason for that. The Jews who had just been liberated from Egypt and who followed Moses through the desert were called a... Kahal, an assembly. The Greek translators of the Septuagint, remember this is the uh, kind of most important translation of the Old Testament into Greek. They rendered this word, kahal, assembly, describing the people of Israel as ecclesia. Okay, it sounds like ecclesiastical, right? We got that from, from that. And ecclesia, okay, we're talking some Greek here. Um, you know, this is where I need Father Tomlinson because he's the, the Greek expert here. Um, you know, I, I, I don't do Greek. <laughs> but anyway, ek and kalo. Uh, having been called forth. So the assembly, this kachal, is the people that have been called forth. Just as Israel had been called forth from the slavery of Egypt to assemble at the feet of Mount, or the foot of Mount Sinai to receive the divine law, the church was called forth from the side of Christ to assemble in the world to receive divine love. Now, the church had always felt herself different from the assembly of Israel. And in her documents and theology, she is often referred to herself by way of all these images and metaphors, especially of those in the Bible. And Lumen Gentium chapter 6 refers to many of them. The sheepfold, right? the vine, the land, Jerusalem, a mother. There's all these images from the scriptures that are used for the special assembly, the church which has been called forth from the side of Christ. But the image which is closest to describing most accurately what the church is, is the body of Christ. Christ. 
Christ is the head, and we are the members. Paul's letters to the Corinthians and Romans are rich in developing this image of the redeemed as members of the body of which Christ is the head. Now, of course, I'm not going to go into everything from the scriptures on all of this because, you know, if you want that, just read Corinthians and Romans. It's all there. Um, But, fast forward towards Vatican II, Pius XII in, remember the encyclical that I asked y'all to read for this class, Mystici Corporis. Okay, who did their homework? Mm, Okay. (laughs) Okay, well, you'll get some Mystici Corporis today during this. Pius XII in Mystici Corporis lays out a consistent doctrine on the inner nature of the church, using the image of the mystical body as his chief theme. The church for Pius XII is unlike any other organization on earth. Quote, The church is not made up of merely moral and juridical elements and principles. It is far superior to all other human societies. It surpasses them as grace surpasses nature, as things immortal are above all those that perish. Such human societies, and in the first place civil society, are by no means to be despised or belittled, but the church in its entirety is not found within this natural order, any more than the whole man is encompassed within the organism of our mortal body. Paragraph 63. So in other words, what he's getting at is that the church is not just some kind of ordinary society. It's not just a bunch of people who kind of get together and we just do church, right? There's more to it than that. As the church fathers put it, the church is an extension of the incarnation. Okay, now, that is a loaded phrase there. Okay, so the Incarnation is the mystery by which the second person of the Blessed Trinity took on flesh and became man, right? So that the Church is an extension of the Incarnate Word. Um, If you are interested in reading a really, really fantastic, deep theological um, meditation and reflection on this concept, Charles Journet who was a Swiss theologian who really is one of my he really is one of my favorite theologians I really at some point I want to write like this biography of him because he's amazing uh, 20th century cardinal wrote a book uh, called The Church of the Incarnate Word the only problem is it's three volumes and only volume one is available in English uh, Ignatius Press has done kind of a uh, an editing of it which is called The Theology of the Church uh, and it really kind of develops these you know this whole idea of the church as the extension of the incarnate word. Now, Pius XII highlights the fact that the church is a visible reality. It's not just a collection of people who feel themselves to be inspired by Christ. Quote, we deplore and condemn. That doesn't sound like Vatican II at all, does it? It does sound like Pius XII, though. We deplore and condemn the pernicious error of those who dream of an imaginary church, a kind of society that finds its origin and growth in charity, to which somewhat contemptually they oppose one another, which they call juridical. Paragraph 65, right? Because already at this time, there were people, even within the Catholic Church, who were like, oh, well, you know, the church is all peace and love, man. It's all peace and love. It's all over here doing their thing. It's great. And we're all like brothers in the spirit and all that. And then there's those nasty, you know, legal, institutional, hierarchical people. That has nothing to do with the church, right? So he's condemning that and saying that that, that opposition between the two, that ain't Catholic. Okay. He does admit, though, that there can be a lack of charity in the body, but that such a lack should not in any way cause people to leave the church. Quote, If at times there appears in the church something that indicates the weakness of our human nature, it should not be attributed to her juridical constitution, but rather to that regrettable inclination to evil found in each individual. Christ did not wish to exclude sinners from his church. Hence, if some of her members are suffering from spiritual maladies, that is no reason why we should lessen our love for the church, but rather a reason why we should increase our devotion to her members. Paragraph 66. 
This is important. He says that sinners are still a part of the church and that their sin should cause us to greater love and sacrifice for them as members of the body of Christ. And I think that this is a really important kind of meditation for today because how many of you, I I know I certainly have come across this, you know, you'll come across someone who, you know, you find out in conversation and well, I used to be Catholic, Right. And then you're like, okay, well, I'm going to take the bait. Let's have this conversation. Right. Okay. Well, why did you used to be Catholic? And sometimes, not all the time, you know, they will mention someone who hurt them or hurt someone who they love, who sinned against them. And they're like, well, that's why I left the church. Right. What Pius XII is saying here is that, well, the church is... We're all sinners. This is all kind of part of this. And the existence of sin should cause us not to leave the church, but to love those people even more so that by our example of their love, they may be converted. Right? This is really important. Um, The Pope is not content, however, just to say that we should love the sinners in the church. Quote, In order to guard against the gradual weakening of that sincere love which requires us to see our Savior in the church and in its members, it is most fitting that we should look at Jesus himself as the perfect model of love for the church. Paragraph 95. The, this encyclical, Mystici Corporis, it's ecclesiology, okay, which is kind of you know, the fun theological word for thinking about the church. You know, the ecclesiology of Mystici Corporis is very elevated. Right? This is not this kind of concept that the church is a bunch of people just kind of get together and praise Jesus. Right? Okay, this is the, he's going back to something very high and very elevated. The church is no human construct but is the body of Christ. Thus we are called by God to act in accordance with what we are. If we are Christ, then we have to be truly Christ-like to others. And Pius provides not only a profound meditation on what the church is, but more importantly, that she should be like Christ, who is the perfect model. Now, Pius XII's encyclical and Lumen Gentium, the document we're going to study tonight, they didn't come out of nowhere. Okay, Just as, remember how last week we talked about Sacrosanctum Concidium, the liturgy document, just as it succeeded in giving life within the church to the theological ideas floating around academia about a liturgical movement, remember we talked about all that last week? These two documents, Mystici Corporis, Lumen Gentium, Propose as teaching on the church the cold wisdom of several centuries of theological investigation. Okay, these things did not just kind of parachute out the sky. Okay. Now, until the Protestant Reformation, there wasn't really a lot of thought about the church per se. Okay, now that may come as kind of a surprise because, well, there kind of was one church. You know, and the Orthodox were kind of schismed off and they were doing their thing. But there was one church, and I didn't have to really think about it all that much. The church knew what it meant to be outside of the church, you know, like the Jews or the infidels. And theologians often crafted apologetic arguments to convince them by reason of the reasonableness of Christian doctrine. You know, one of the most famous examples of this is St. Thomas Aquinas's Summa Contra Gentiles. Now, a lot of people, you know, when they hear St. Thomas Aquinas, they've heard of the Summa Theologiae or the Summa Theologica, right? But this was like, okay, well, how can we convince people who aren't Christian at all of the fact that what we believe is actually reasonable? It's actually accessible to human reason. So this was very important. Now, the church also knew what it meant to separate oneself from the communion of believers by one or more of three sins. Heresy. Apostasy and schism. Now, if I say these three words, do you know the difference between the three? Okay. Okay. Because they're not all the same. Okay. When we're talking about heresy, that is an obstinate refusal to assent to one or more truths of the faith. Okay. 
Schism means that uh, you separate yourself from the communion of believers. And apostasy is rejection of basically the whole kit and caboodle, right? Okay, that, I mean, that, that's kind of the, you know, the simple way to understand it. Now, of course, if you think about, I mean, schism obviously kind of involves some element of heresy to a certain degree because, you know, be, you know being in communion with the, the Roman pontiff is also a doctrine. So there's kind of something here. But, you know, sometimes you hear people who use these words kind of interchangeably, and they're really not. It's important to be kind of precise about this. Uh, so, you know, your Catholic friend who ends up going off to a non-denominational church is not really technically an apostate. Uh, maybe a heretic, maybe a schismatic, not an apostate. Okay. Uh, someone who, you know, then becomes a Satanist, eh, yeah, that's pretty much apostasy, right? Okay, so we'll make sure we have these things clear. So my point is that the church, you know, even in, in the late Middle Ages, you know, the church is like, okay, well, we understand heresy, apostasy, schism, we kind of get these things. The 16th century presented the church with an entirely new situation. Okay. Because now you had all these bodies of Christians who were living outside of the visible confines of the church, claiming that the true church was not a visible hierarchical communion with which you had to be in communion at all. Okay. For them, the true church was a spiritual union of believers. Okay. Now, Council of Trent. Remember we talked about the council, uh, the reforming council of the 16th century. The council never directly condemned the invisible notion of the church, although it certainly assumed that the Catholic Church calls herself visible, because otherwise what's the point of having a council? Because that's kind of a visible exercise of, of the church doing her thing. Now, the Protestants were actually called to come to the council and guaranteed safe passage, but they didn't come. They were like, we're not playing ball with you people. We don't want to talk to you. So that kind of, you know, one of the many reasons why discussions between Protestants and Catholics broke down was that when there was a chance at the Council of Trent, they're just like, nah. So that kind of, you know, was a missed opportunity that might have borne some fruit. But, you know, the past is the past. Now, the theological literature after the Council, meditating on what it meant to be the Church, consistently condemned the notion of the Church as invisible and spiritual. Okay. Now, one of the most important theologians from this time period that is really important to uh, read is St. Robert Bellarmine. And St. Robert Bellarmine expressed this notion most succinctly by upholding the church as both a spiritual and a visible reality. He was the one who conceived the notion of the three parts of the church. I'm sure that some of this might sound familiar to you. The church militant, the church triumphant, and the church suffering. Now we talk about these three parts of the church. Where do we find the church militant? On earth, that's right. That's those of us who are soldiers of Christ by the virtue of our sacrament of confirmation. The church triumphant, where do we find that? Heaven. Church suffering? Purgatory. Okay, so it was Robert Bellarmine who really kind of gave uh, this kind of understanding. Okay, here's, here's what we're talking about when we talk about the church. Now, he also said that the church was, and here is something which gives some people total apoplexy, the church was a societas perfecta, a perfect society. Now, when some people hear this, they're like, have you been to a Catholic church recently? I mean, really? Seriously? Have you met Father Smith? Right. So, you know, this idea of a perfect society, you just look at the Catholic church and like, God, these people are, are delusional, right? Perfect in this case does not mean immaculate, without sin, but perfect in the sense that the church has everything she needs to pursue the ends for which she was constituted and is lacking in nothing. Okay, so the church is a perfect society because she's got all she needs because she is the body of Christ. So she doesn't need anything from the outside. She's not you know, lacking in that way. Now, Bellarmine's ecclesiology was very influential, and it formed the basis for Catholic apologetics and theology well into the time of Pius XII, who quotes him in Mystici Corporis, uh, paragraph 53, quote, As Bellarmine notes with acumen and accuracy, this appellation of the body of Christ is not to be explained solely by the fact that Christ must be called the head of his mystical body, but also by the fact that he so sustains the church, and so in a certain sense lives in the church. 
that she is, as it were, another Christ. End quote. Now, this kind of post-Trent theology, this Tridentine theology, conceived of the church in terms of visible bonds of communion with the papacy. But even though that was the case, Catholic theologians already in the early 19th century began to study the church from a different perspective. Johann Adam Moller, professor of dogma at Tübingen in Germany, spoke of the church not just in juridical terms, not just legal terms, but as an organism whose basis is the supernatural life given by Christ. The church is the mystical body of Christ, the manifestation in the world of God's mercy. And Muller began a century and a half of theological inquiry on the church no longer from the perspective of what it does and how it acts, which is called an axiological description. Okay, so that's do, act, right? But from what she is in her inner nature, which is the ontological description. Okay, see how there's a difference between do and act and is, right? So they're related, but they're different. One is a description of what the church does, how she acts. The other is her inner nature, what she is. Okay, the difference between those is called the axiological and the ontological description. That's just some, you know, theological vocabulary that might be used for you someday when you're writing a doctoral dissertation on this. So, the way was paved for a conception of the church which in no way denied the visible and juridical nature of the church, but which stressed its ultimate nature is sacramental in character. Okay, Moeller is saying, well, yeah, the church is visible. The church is, uh, there's juridical things or legal things that are part of the church, but what the church really is, is sacramental in character. Now, remember how in our first class we talked about the modernists, Right. Okay. The modernists tried to say that Christ never tried to found a church at all. Uh, one of the most famous of the modernists was a man named Alfred Loisy, who said, Christ came to announce the kingdom and it's the church that's come. Right. And the idea was that, okay, Jesus had this whole kind of kingdom proclamation thing, and instead we got all these horrifying rules and regulations and all this, like, you know, churchy stuff, which is really not what Jesus had in mind, right? So the modernists were saying this. And the modernists were saying that the constitution of the church is not divinely revealed, okay? St. Pius X, remember him, okay, in 1903 wrote a document called Lamentabile Sane. And Lamentabile... I'm sorry, 1907, excuse me. Okay, this is why Father should look at his notes. Okay, 1907, Lamentabile Sane condemned these propositions. But they resurfaced around the time of the Council, particularly in the theology of two men. And if you study anything about Vatican II, these names are going to come up. Hans Kung and Edvard Skillebeeks. Okay, these were kind of giant theological names of the council. So you will see these names constantly come up in literature about this time period. Hans Kung's license to teach Catholic theology was revoked in 1979. And you know, it's really interesting because Ratzinger and Kung um, were very friendly uh, because they were probably the biggest names in German theology around the time of the council. Uh, and needless to say, you know, they kind of, uh, you know, are not exactly on the same page, really. Um, Edvard Skillebeeks as well. Um, Both of these guys claimed that the sacramental and hierarchical nature of the church was not divinely inspired, but it was merely the result of history and alien to both the ancient church and the democratic spirit of modern times. Now, the ecclesiology, remember we talked about this kind of, you know, thinking about the church, of Kung and Skilabiks was vastly influential around the time of the council. 
and provided the basis for liberation theology, okay, and that's something we unfortunately can't go into much in this class, but is a super important thing that comes from the time period, and other attempts in theology to shed the church of the type of constitution that both Pius XII and Vatican II claim as being divinely revealed. The numerous documents of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith during the pontificate of John Paul II were an attempt to underscore traditional Catholic teaching in the face of resurgent modernism inherent in much of contemporary ecclesiology. Okay. So Vatican II is like, okay, the, you know, the church is kind of divinely revealed and divinely instituted. This is not just some kind of accident of history, um, which is what Skillabeeks and Kung to a large degree were claiming. Now, much of the debate of modern ecclesiology, which was inspired by modernism, is centered around the relationship between the visible hierarchical Catholic Church and what is meant by the Church of Christ. Okay. They're saying those two are not the same thing. Okay. Now, let's go back to the Council of Trent, Robert Bellarmine and friends. Th- that notion of church emphasizing the visible and juridical nature of the church was merely to state that the Catholic Church is the Church of Christ. Okay? That's just kind of how they expressed it, very simply. Pius XII in Mystici Corporis, paragraph 13, says, If we would define and describe this true Church of Jesus Christ which is the one holy Catholic, apostolic, and Roman church, we shall find nothing more noble, more sublime, or more divine than the expression of the mystical body of Christ. There is a mere identification. But, you know, one can see in Mystici Corporis the seeds of a vision of the church which is more than just identification. Paragraph 17. One must not think, however, that this ordered or organic structure of the body of the church contains only hierarchical elements, and with them is complete. Or, as an opposite opinion holds, that it is composed only of those who enjoy charismatic gifts. Okay, so what is he getting at? The church is not just the hierarchy and those who are in visible communion with the hierarchy. There's more to the church than that. Now, Pius XII speaks of the relationship of non-Catholic Christians to the Catholic Church, paragraph 103. Even though by an unconscious desire and longing, they have a certain relationship with the mystical body of the Redeemer, they still remain deprived of those many heavenly gifts and helps which can only be enjoyed in the Catholic Church. Therefore, may they enter into Catholic unity and join with us in the one organic body of Jesus Christ. May they together with us run on to the one head in the society of glorious love. Right? It's not like one of the weird like 1960s free love, the society of glorious love. Right? If you understand it perfectly, it's actually really beautiful. There's a desire that Pius XII is expressing here to see non-Catholic Christians united with the visible Catholic Church. Okay? But that raises a question, doesn't it? Okay, so what is the relationship of a non-Catholic with the Church? Okay? And this is kind of a thorny question. Okay, think about this. Is it the sacrament of baptism which incorporates you into the body of Christ? Yeah. Okay, that's the point. Okay. Well, if that's true, then any baptized person is part of the church, right? Okay. And we've just seen that the Catholic Church is the Church of Christ, right? Yet, there are many Christians who are not in visible communion with the church. So, are they in invisible communion with the church? Can they be said to be members of the church? Well, if so, how? This is kind of an important question, right? Pius XII says, and this is paragraph 22, Only those are to be included as members of the church who have been baptized and professed the true faith, and who have not been so unfortunate as to separate themselves from the unity of the body, or been excluded by legitimate authority for grave faults committed. End quote. So, baptized Christians who have not knowingly set themselves apart from the church are true members of the church. Okay. Yet, still, we have numerous Christians who are still not in visible communion with the church and through no fault of their own, okay, because they have not committed the sins of heresy, schism, or apostasy. Right? So what are they in relation to the church? Vatican II sought to clarify this question. Lumen Gentium chapter 8 speaks of the Church of Christ described in the Creed as one holy Catholic and apostolic. 
quote, The church constituted and organized in the world as a society subsists in the Catholic Church, which is governed by the successor of Peter and by the bishops in communion with him. Although many elements of sanctification and of truth are found outside of its visible structure. These elements, as gifts belonging to the Church of Christ, are forces impelling toward Catholic unity. So, I want to drill into this a little bit. The, the Church of Christ subsists in the Catholic Church. Subsists, subsistit. The word subsistit in scholastic Latin is not is, but a word which means stands under. Stands, sorry, under. Okay, I know this is really terrible to read my kind of, you know, Arabic calligraphy here. Okay, in other words, it's a stronger word than is. Because it denotes the idea of perfection, like the idea of the church as a perfect society. Now, the word had been suggested, because remember, the church is trying to find, we've got to find a word to really express this. The word was actually suggested by the man who is behind the crafting of Mystici Corporates, Sebastian Trump. who is a professor at the Gregorian University, so my alma mater. Uh, our doctoral dissertation from the early 2000s posits that Trump, who is the secretary for the Doctrinal Commission of Vatican II, suggested it as a Latin word to intensify the notion in Pius XII's encyclical of the relationship between the Catholic Church and the Church of Christ, not as an opening for ecumenism. This is an interesting idea. Okay, Why? Many theologians chose to use meanings of modern translations of subsistere, ignoring the Latin philosophical meaning of the term. Okay? For example, several dictionaries have as one of the meanings of the English word subsist, quote, to have existence in. Right. Okay, well, if to subsist means to have existence in one place, well, that it does not then logically follow that that thing cannot also exist somewhere, right? Okay, French people can exist in France, but they can also exist in Greenville, South Carolina, right? Okay. I'm sorry, surely not, that's right. And Alsatian's even worse, right? So, <laughs> so. Now, apply this to the church, and then the meaning of the Church of Christ subsists in the Catholic Church means that the Church of Christ exists in the Catholic Church, but it can also exist elsewhere. Right? So you see that if you use this kind of modern English understanding of the word subsist, it is entirely different than the Latin word subsistit, which it translates. Okay? This is a super important point. Okay. Um, under the classical, okay, wait, okay, right, back pedal, okay. The elements of sanctification and truth found outside of the visible structure of the Catholic Church then take on a different meaning, don't they? Okay. Under the classical Latin understanding of subsistere, these elements do not mean that those elements are part of the Church of Christ. But if you take the same Latin word with one of its vernacular modern meanings, those very elements then con constitute the existence of the Catholic Church outside of the Catholic Church because of the very existence of those elements. Okay? This is a very kind of thorny theological point. Okay, this is why you know, I say you got to know your Latin. Okay, you have to know your Latin because if you don't, then you can easily have a very skewed understanding of what the council is getting at. Now, remember how first class we talked about intentio auctores, right? The intention of the author. While it was the intentio auctoris of Sebastian Tron to use the word to uphold the traditional Catholic teaching of the relationship between the Catholic Church and the Church of Christ, there was a whole bunch of theologians who played a semantics game by representing the teaching of Vatican II as changing that of Pius XII. If you know your Latin, you can't do that, right? If all you know is your English, then we're in trouble. Okay? You see how this is kind of a big deal. Okay. Now, okay, for these theologians, Church of Christ equals Catholic Church plus elements found outside of it. 
That is very different than the intention of Trump, which was Church of Christ equals the Catholic Church, comma, and elements of the Church also exist outside of her. Those are two very different conceptions of the church, aren't they? Okay. And think about how once you start relating that to ecumenism, uh, dialogue with other Christians, interreligious dialogue, then that really changes the game considerably, doesn't it? Now, the falsification of this fundamental ecclesiological principle of Vatican II has led many right back into the modernist statements about the church and to disobedience to the visible Catholic Church. Right? Because if the Catholic Church, if the Church of Christ is Catholic Church plus elements found outside of it, then, you know, is it really all of a big deal that, you know, I start going to, you know, non-denominational fill-in-the-blank with some word like, you know, reality or velocity or, you know, the Church have all these names, right? Is it really all that big of a deal, right? Now, the situation in theology was so bad about this And Vatican II invoked by so many of them that the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith in 2007 wrote a document entitled Responses to Some Questions Regarding Certain Aspects of the Doctrine on the Church. I'm not going to write all that out. Okay. In its text, the congregation clarifies the true meaning of the Latin word. Because remember, in Vatican II, they just kind of throw the word out there, right? And they're like, well, obviously everybody knows their Latin, because we're all speaking Latin here at the council, so everybody knows what subsisted it means, except for the fact that they didn't know what subsisted meant because they weren't paying attention to the Latin, so it became kind of a problem. Quote, Christ established here on earth only one one church and instituted as a visible and spiritual community, and that sounds very Robert Bellarmine, doesn't it? That from its beginning and throughout the centuries has always existed and will always exist, and which alone are found all the elements that Christ himself instituted. This one church of Christ, which we confess in the creed as one holy Catholic and apostolic, this church constituted and organized in this world as a society subsist in the Catholic Church, governed by the successor of Peter and the bishops in communion with him. In number eight of the Constitution Lumen Gentium, subsistence means this perduring historical continuity and the permanence of all the elements instituted by Christ in the Catholic Church in which the Church of Christ is concretely found on this earth. It is possible, according to Catholic doctrine, to affirm correctly that the Church of Christ is present and operative in the churches and ecclesial communities not yet fully in communion with the Catholic Church on account of the elements of sanctification and truth that are present in them. Nevertheless, the word subsist can only be attributed to the Catholic Church alone because it refers to the mark of unity that we profess in the symbols of the faith. I believe in the one church. And this one church subsists in the Catholic Church. End quote. That's a lot there. But think about how 1964 to 2007, all the way in 2007, there had to be a very substantial clarification about a fundamental notion of our faith. Okay? Now, this clarification on the hills of another document, Dominus Jesus which was actually published seven years earlier, is important in establishing, remember how the first class talked about the hermeneutic of continuity, right? the key to interpretation. It's important to establish the hermeneutic of continuity about the church's teaching on herself before and after Vatican II. And such a clarification has been done by the church's teaching authority, the magisterium herself. Nonetheless, many theologians continue to ignore these two documents. Um, if you go to uh, meetings of certain theological societies and you quote Dominus Jesus in a paper, your academic career is done. It is considered radioactive by many in the theological academic establishment, which is very sad because they're playing semantic games with this one Latin word. It is really, really quite interesting. Now, because... There are these theologians who are basing their entire theology and their ecclesiology on a false rendering of the word subsistere for motives of ideology undergirded by modernist conceptions of the church. It is very serious. Okay, and this is why I'm spending so much time uh, on this one Latin word, because 
You know, there's so many things in Lumen Gentium you can read and you're like, that's fantastic, that's great. Yeah, we don't need to kind of talk about that. But then there's other things, it's like there's a whole history that is there, not only before Vatican II, but after Vatican II as well. Now, yeah. Uh, wait a minute, okay, let me get the whole thing. Okay, responses to some questions regarding certain aspects on, of the doctrine on the church. So yeah, it's a long, long, long title. But um, Okay, now in the syllabus, um, I had a subset which said how Vatican II completes Vatican I, Pope and Bishops. And then I realized that for some reason I do not have my notes on that. <laughs> so I'm not going to, to belabor the point. Um, but remember that when you're talking about the Pope and the Bishops, okay, the Catholic Church is not just the Pope. He's not just the big guy in white in Rome. right? It's the Pope surrounded by the Bishops, which constitutes to the teaching authority of the church, the magisterium. Remember how we talked about how Vatican I was kind of upended early because of the Franco-Prussian War? You know, all of a sudden they're, they're in war and Rome falls and everybody has to leave. The church was going to get around to talking about more about what is the role of the bishops, but they just didn't get around to it. So they had to wait till Vatican II to do that. Um, so in the meantime, you have like 90 years of theological reflection on the office of bishop. And it's really important because one of the things that is crucial in understanding the theology of the time period, um, and this may seem like you know not a big deal, but even in the Middle Ages, there was an idea that all a bishop really is is a priest with jurisdiction. Right. All he really is is a priest who happens to govern. Okay? He's not really any different than a priest. Um, the problem with this is that... Uh, even though this was a theological principle that for many centuries was just kind of accepted as a reality. Pius XII in Christus Dominus um, clarifies that the bishop is the fullness of the priesthood. Um, And what that means is that in some sense, a bishop is not a vicar of the Pope, right? He doesn't, he's not just kind of there as the Pope's lackey in his diocese. He is, in a sense, the vicar of Christ in his diocese. Um, and so it served as a correction to a certain kind of exaggerated understanding of the papal office. Um, and remember that this happened as a historical accident. Okay, because remember, okay, Pius, uh, um, Pius the Ninth, you know, you're talking about Vatican I, talks about papal infallibility, which is a doctrine of the faith, kind of important. Um, but there was nothing about the bishops. Well, what is their role in this? What is their teaching role in this? Because it just fell apart. The whole council fell apart. So it took a while for them to kind of go back to that um, in the sense of, okay, well, what is a bishop really? What is his authority? What is his authority vis-a-vis the Pope as well? Um, And in the meantime, in Catholic experience, then you had two things that were going on. One, just because of media, people became just more uh, aware of the Pope, Right, um, you know, before I mean, you know, nobody knew what the Pope was doing. You know, I mean, I mean, you know, it would take months for you know bishops and priests to know that the Pope read an encyclical letter. Right, you know, now the Pope says something immediately on his in his morning homily at the Casa Santa Marta, and it's like in tweets and memes all over the place within seconds. Right, so there is this visibility that the Pope of Rome has had since the close of Vatican I that he's just never had before. Right, then the other thing is is that there is also this kind of idea that is very important to understand that the concept of the church in many places, uh, and I remember being taught this in high school, like what does the Catholic Church talk about its structure? A pyramid, right? Okay, you have the Pope, and then you have the cardinals, and then you have the bishops, and then you have the priests, and then you have the deacons, and then you have the lay people, right? Okay. Except for the fact that this kind of pyramid is not really what the structure of the church is. Okay. Lumen Gentium is like, no, it's kind of more concentric circles of authority which is shared in different ways. It's a bit more complicated. It's not this kind of top-down thing. There's different roles that are played. Uh, now, the reality of lived life in the church is often it acts as like a top-down structure, but theologically that's not really the case. Um, The role of the bishops in uh, kind of elucidating that at Vatican II was very important to correct an exaggerated emphasis on the role of the Pope. Um, And even now, 
you know, sometimes I, uh, I just kind of put my face in my hands because, you know, you'll have people who, you know, the Holy Father will say something. And uh, remember how we talked about in the first class that there are different degrees of assent, different documents. Um, there are people who, you know, if you say even the slightest thing about, you know, well, I don't like how the Pope sneezes. Oh my gosh, you're a terrible Catholic or an apostate. No, I mean this is not Catholic teaching. Um, you know, you know, should you get up in pulpit and you know mock the Pope for the way he sneezes? No, obviously not. There's a lack of charity. Um, but this kind of conception of this hyper exaggerated notion of papal authority is something which Vatican II and John Paul II, Benedict the Sixteenth, uh, and Francis himself have constantly spoken against. Uh, but sometimes in our lived Catholic existence, there are these just kind of exaggerations of papal authority, uh, which are very foreign to the actual theology of the church. And sometimes when I hear Catholics say these things, I'm like, oh my gosh, you're like the caricature that Protestants draw of us. Um, you know, it, it, there is a whole kind of realm of things in which uh, the Pope can say something and just be wrong. And that's okay. That does not endanger the faith. Um, and if you study the history of the church, you know, you come across things uh, which are not only, you know, popes having mistresses and warring around and doing all this crazy stuff, you know, raping and pillaging as they were wont to do at various times, uh, but also saying just dumb stuff, um, both theologically and politically. You know, you can say these things and it's okay and you're not a bad Catholic. You know, now, that is different than uh, saying things which, uh, which is calling into question the teaching authority of the church. Okay? And we'll drill into that a little bit more. Uh, but So I wanted to kind of give that to a sense that you know, Vatican II is completing the work of Vatican I by filling out the papal ministry with also the understanding of, of what the bishops are. Okay? Now, Pius XII in Mystici Corporis speaks of the holiness of Christ and the church and urges the members of the church to be more closely conformed to Christ. Now, I want you to think a little bit about the first half of the 20th century. Okay? When it comes to Catholic history, it really was an incredible time. There is a huge, incredible missionary expansion to every part of the globe, flourishing vocations of the priesthood, religious life, secular institutes, active involvement of the laity and the social apostle of the church and theological inquiry. It really was an incredible time to be a Catholic. And there was a clear call for the laity to be involved in the work of the church. This movement called Catholic Action, which called Catholics to act for their faith. Remember how, you know, last time we talked about the liturgical movement, uh, which promised great fruits in society if Catholics really understood and lived the liturgy better, promising a transformation of the temporal order by a laity imbued with zeal for souls. Now, this emphasis on action informed by prayerful contemplation brought Catholics away from the notion of involvement in the church as something for those in the priesthood and religious life. But many Catholics still clung to a notion that religious perfection had to be reserved to an elite of priest and religious. That ordinary faithful in the world could never aspire to sanctity the way that priests, monks, and nuns could, because their existence in the world compromised their holiness because they were staying in the world. Okay. This is an attitude which was very prevalent in certain sectors at the time. The, there's one problem with this, though. It's totally bunk. Right. It's very foreign to sound Catholic spirituality. Authors like St. Francis de Sales, uh, who is you know counter-Catholic Reformation saint, often encouraged laity in the world to be holy wherever they were, and derided any notion that a lay person in the world could not be holy. He wrote in uh, his Introduction to the Devout Life, It is an error, or rather a heresy, to wish to banish the devout life from the regiment of soldiers, the mechanic shop, the court of princes, or the home of married people. It is true, Philothea, which is kind of his you know, pet name for devout soul, that purely contemplative, monastic, and religious devotion cannot be exercised in such states of life. However, besides those three kinds of devotion, there are several others adapted to bring perfection to those living in the secular state. Wherever we may be, we can and should aspire to a perfect life. End quote. 
Spiritual writers had always encouraged holiness for the laity in the midst of the world. But the church's magisterium, while it had spoken of the need of the faithful to work for the good of the church, had not spoken of the vocation specific to the laity as opposed to clergy and religious and its relationship to holiness. Now, sometimes, you know, as you're reading things about Vatican II, you know, you'll come across this whole idea of Vatican II as the council of the laity. And sometimes people will say, well, Vatican II gave the church back to the laity, right? Sometimes you'll, you'll hear this. Well, okay, this is, we need a little bit of nuance here. Vatican II does speak of the laity, but also of every other aspect of the church's life. And this kind of cry of giving the church back to the laity somehow pretends that the ultimate thing in the church is power. And it should be given from one caste to another. Irrespective of the non-existence of a caste system in the church. And of the fact that the hierarchy was divinely constituted by Christ. And sometimes you see this in debates about things like women's ordination. right? It's like, okay, well they need to have power too. And it's like, well, that's not really the point. One of the most interesting things, uh, one of the most fascinating liberal theologians is a woman named Elizabeth Schussler Fiorenza, who teaches at Harvard. And um, she was a big advocate of women's ordination for many years and read all kinds of things about this. Well, at a certain point, um, she kind of flipped and she said something which I was like, yes, you get it, but for entirely the wrong reasons. She said, ordination is subordination, and that is exactly what we don't want. Right? If you understand the church merely in terms of power, then it's a, well, some other people need to have power in here, right? If you understand ordination in terms of subordination to the law of Christ and the needs of the faithful, then that puts an entirely different spin on everything. So, again, this was, you know, Schuster Fiorenza saying the right thing, you know, getting something, but saying it for kind of the wrong reasons. So, anyway, she's a really fascinating person to read. Uh, but, you know, obviously, you know, kind of, you know, Part of this whole heresy thing. But anyway, that's another story for another cocktail party. Okay, now, now, of course, it is not the purpose of this class to discuss Vatican II and the laity, but because I know how you like getting your gold star from Father to read all kinds of other stuff that you don't have time for, but is really extremely interesting, um, there are two really cool things. One is Vatican II actually has a document specifically on the laity. Actuositatem Apostolicum. And then John Paul II has an absolutely beautiful encyclical, I think it's an encyclical, uh, called Christi Fidelis Laici, you know, the Christ faithful laity. One of the persistent problems in the interpretation of Vatican II has been a one-sided emphasis on the place of the laity and the apostle of the church, often seen only in terms of power struggles and ideology. But once we place the theology of the laity of Vatican II against the backdrop of the council's spiritual expectations of the whole church, we're all supposed to be holy, right? There's a different pattern emerges. Now, permit me a moment of editorializing, okay? If I had to say what the greatest contribution of Lumen Gentium is, is that it forever ends the possibility of a minimalist duty fulfillment attitude towards membership in the church and Christian discipleship. Um, Sometimes when I say this, people get, their hackles go up, right? Because I'm basically saying, you know, all this, you know, do your little checks on your check boxes or whatever, and then if you, you know, mark the boxes, then you go to heaven. That's a nonsense. This is gone. Forget it. You know, the church said, nah, uh uh-uh. So that's not sufficient. Previous documents of the magisterium focused on the minimum standard of what you had to do to be considered a good Catholic. Okay. Fourth Lateran Council. In 1215, which is an amazing council in all kinds of, in all kinds of ways, um, it mandated that all Catholics of the age of reason had to confess their sins once a year and receive communion during Eastertide. This is called the Easter duty, right? You've heard of this, right? Um, Catholics of a certain age, they knew this because it was drilled into their heads in the catechism. You've got to go to confession once a year, and you've got to receive communion during Eastertide. If you don't do that, that is the minimum of being a Catholic. The problem with this, of course, is that it gives you a minimum of being a Catholic, And so 
it's not exactly very inspiring, right? Okay, well, to be a disciple of Christ, then, okay, well, yeah, you get a confession once a year and receive communion during Eastertide. Well, that's great, but, you know, what is that? The whole fifth chapter of Lumen Gentium, paragraphs 39 to 42. If you didn't do your homework, no indulgences for you. Um, if you didn't do your homework, read these documents. Go back. 39 to 42 is on the universal call to holiness. Okay? Remember, Pius XII has said that the model of perfection for the church was Christ. Lumen Gentium 40, calling Jesus the divine teacher and model of all perfection, notes that Jesus preached holiness of life to everyone. Be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Therefore, paragraph 40, all the faithful of Christ to whatever rank or status are called to the fullness of Christian life and to the perfection of charity. In order that the faithful may reach this perfection, they must use their strength accordingly as they have received it as a gift from Christ. They must follow in his footsteps and conform themselves to his image, seeking the will of the Father in all things. They must devote themselves with all their being to the glory of God and the service of their neighbor. End quote. The faithful are encouraged no longer to a minimum, but to be like Christ. Lateran 4, you've got to go to confession once a year and go to communion at Eastertide. Vatican 2, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. That kind of raises the bar, right? Considerably. Um, The council also admits of no exceptions. Paragraph 41, the classes and duties of life are many, but holiness is one. That sounds straight out of St. Francis de Sales, doesn't it? Paragraph 42, all the faithful of Christ are invited to strive for the holiness and perfection of their own proper state. Indeed, they have an obligation to so strive. Let all then have care that they guide or write their own deepest sentiments of soul. Let neither the use of the things of this world nor attachment to riches, which is against the spirit of evangelical poverty, hinder them in their quest for perfect love. End quote. This, I think, is the novelty, in some sense, of Vatican II. This, I think, is the heart of the teaching of Vatican II. I think this is what the Council Fathers were really drilling into with all of the documents of Vatican II. And I also think that it is the thing which has fallen on the most deaf ears after Vatican II. Because so many Catholics are still trapped in a mindset of minimalism when it comes to their discipleship in Christ. And it is the task of the church. We do have to evangelize outside of the church, right? You want you know, people who aren't Catholics, who aren't Christians, to come into the church. The biggest mission, you want to talk about implementing Vatican II, it's not about you know, the laity doing stuff that, that used to be reserved entirely to the priest alone. Okay? It's not about the laity invading the sanctuary, which Pope Francis has recently said. Um, it is about the faithful being holy being true disciples of Jesus Christ and not holding themselves to minimal standards of practice. It is, it is the, the beautiful spiritual center of the last ecumenical council, this universal call to holiness. Now, next week, we will go into uh, Dei Verbum. Okay. Oh, let me. Okay. Get rid of some of this up in here. De Verbum, which is the document on divine revelation. And the corresponding encyclical of Pius XII, Divino Aflatu Spiritu. It deals with a lot of stuff about the Bible and divine revelation. So we will go into that. All right. Now, I know some of you were having uh, you know, questions as things were going up. Remember that uh, I will take questions that have to do with Lumen Gentium and things related to that, uh, and I can always punt them to another time. Yes, Will. Um, 